Hi everyone, in this video we're going to evaluate a pretty interesting, a pretty strange looking Gaussian-like integral, which is the integral from minus infinity up to infinity of e to the minus ax squared minus b over x squared with respect to x, um, and here a and b are going to be positive real parameters. All right, so we want to evaluate this. The first thing I'm going to do, for reasons uh, that will become clear later, is to rewrite this using um, one of the symmetry properties of the integrand. So notice that the integrand, e to the minus ax squared minus b over x squared, is an even function, because when we switch x to minus x, then you get back the same thing. And so when we integrate an even function from minus infinity to infinity, that's the same as integrating it from 0 to infinity and multiplying by 2, because your function is basically symmetrical about the y-axis. Okay. Um, if you picture that as the picture, the integral as the area under the curve, um, that kind of helps to visualize why that's the case. And so we can rewrite that as twice the integral from zero to infinity of the same thing, e to the minus ax squared minus b over x squared dx. Okay, that's going to make our lives a bit easier um, later on. So one thing I want to note also is we can easily evaluate this. Uh, in the case where b is 0, right? So if b is 0, then i is just the integral um, from minus infinity to infinity of e to the minus ax squared with respect to x. That's just the standard Gaussian integral, right? So I'm not going to derive that result now, um, but it's a pretty standard result, and it's root pi over a, okay? And so we're going to take that as a, as a given. And so we can actually use this as our starting point, the fact that we know how to do this integral when b is 0. So what we're going to do is see how i changes as we change b. Okay, so what I mean more specifically is we're going to take our i and we're going to differentiate it partially with respect to b. All right, so if we uh, use this form here with the 2 in front of it, then we differentiate with respect to b what we get is just 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity um, of, well, d by db of e to the minus ax squared minus b over x squared with respect to x. And then let's actually do that differentiation. So it's going to be 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of, well, the coefficient of b in this exponent is minus 1 over x squared, right? So we just pull down a factor of minus 1 over x squared, uh, and then we get the same thing in the exponent. So e to the minus ax squared minus b over x squared, and that is with respect to x. Now we're going to do a substitution, um, and so what we're going to do is let u be 1 over x, or x to the minus 1. If u is x to the minus 1, then du, by differentiating the right-hand side, is just going to be minus x to the minus 2 dx. Um, and that's why we're doing this substitution, basically, because, well, minus x to the minus 2 dx is the same as minus 1 over x squared dx, which looks familiar from this integral that we have here. Right? We've got a minus 1 over x squared, and we've got a dx. So this substitution should be helpful. Right, so um, if we actually do that substitution, what's going to happen? Well, we still have this 2 out the front. What's going to happen to the limits is that when x is 0 at the bottom here, u tends towards infinity, right? Because 1 over x tends towards infinity. So we get an infinity as on our lower limit. And as x tends towards infinity, the upper limit, u tends towards 0. It gets smaller and smaller, right? So basically, the limits just flip around. This, by the way, is why we did this thing of, of writing it as twice the integral from 0 to infinity. Um, it just uh, makes it a bit easier to work out what the limits of your integral should be after you do this substitution. Okay, so what is the integrand itself going to be? Well, let's deal with the exponential part first. We get e to the minus a over u squared, right? Because remember, u is 1 over x, or x is 1 over u. Uh, and then we get minus b u squared. And then this minus 1 over x squared and this dx combine together just to give us a du. All right, so... Um, what can we do with that? Well, we can flip the limits around and put a minus sign in front of the whole thing, right? So that's just going to be 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus 
bu squared also re reordering the terms in the in the exponent in the exponent so minus bu squared minus a over u squared du notice that this looks quite similar to what we started with up here right um, it's just the b and the a are flipped around and also we've got a u instead of an x but it doesn't matter because we're integrating over that variable anyway and what we can actually do to make it look even more like what we started with is another substitution, right? So um, now what I'd like to do is let um, u be equal to the square root of a over b times some other variable, let's call it t. You'll see why this is useful in a second. Uh, and if this is the case, then we can differentiate that straightforwardly to find that du is the square root of a over b times dt. Right, so what's going to happen when we do that next substitution? We still got this uh, minus 2 out the front. The limits are going to be the same, right, because um, u is just proportional to t. There's just a constant factor relating those, so we still integrate from 0 to infinity. Um, and then what's going to happen to our exponent? It's going to be minus b, um, but u squared is going to be a over b times t squared, All right? So the b's are going to cancel. Um, and then similarly, the second term, we are going to get a times, um, let me write this as a fraction, uh, it's going to be a over, and u squared again is a over b t squared, and du was um, root a over b times dt. All right, there we go. Now we just have to simplify our exponent a tiny bit more. And let's also pull out the prefactor out of the integral. So we get minus 2 square root of a over b integral from 0 to infinity of e to the uh, minus. Well, what's going to happen? These b's are going to cancel. You've got a b there and a b there. And so you just get a minus a t squared. And Similarly, for this second term, you've got a over a over b. That whole thing just simplifies to b, right? The a's cancel, and then you've got 1 over 1 over b, which is the same thing as b. And so the second term becomes minus b over t squared, and that's with respect to t. And now you can see we've got almost exactly what we started with, um, except there is an extra factor of root a over b, and there's also this minus sign, right? If you compare this, this expression down here with this um, expression up at the top here, right? Um, twice the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus ax squared plus b over x squared, it's exactly the same as what we've got down here. So let me just rub out some of these lines. And uh, so what we can do is say that that's the same thing as minus uh, the square root of a over b, just times what uh, what we started with, which is i. Right? Again, it doesn't matter that we have t's instead of x's because that's just a dummy variable that we're integrating uh, integrating over. So to summarize, what we found is that um, the partial derivative of i, which is what we're trying to find with respect to b, is just minus the square root of a over b times i. Okay, um, and so this is actually just a differential equation which we can solve for i. So I'm firstly just going to rewrite this um, in a way that's going to make it easier to solve this differential equation. And so we're going to get the square root of a times b to the minus a half, just writing it as a power because that makes it easier to integrate, uh, times i. So let's do some integration uh, to solve that differential equation. We are going to get, um, okay, for now, just forget about the fact this is this is a partial derivative. We'll come back to that. Uh, if we just um, take the i over to the left-hand side, uh, we are going to get the integral of di over i on the left-hand side. And the right-hand side, we're going to get minus the square root of a, so minus root a, um, and we're going to get the integral of b to the minus a half db. So I've basically separated the variables, put all the i's on the left and put all the b's on the right, and then integrated those. And so if we do that integration, the left-hand side evaluates to the natural log of i. The right-hand side evaluates to minus root a. And then if we integrate b to the minus half, we just get b to the half divided by a half. Right? And so if we divide by um, half, that's the same as multiplying by 2, 
So let's put a two there. And then um, b to the half is the same as root b. So basically, this whole thing here is just minus two times the square root of a times the square root of b, which we can write as minus two root a b. And then we have to add in our constant of integration. This is where the fact that it was a partial derivative is important, right? Because the constant of integration is not really a constant. It is a function of a. Okay, we integrated with respect to b, treating a as a constant. And so we can add on some arbitrary function of a. Right, so we've got ln i is minus 2 root a b plus some function of a. Um, and so we can exponentiate both sides to find that i equals e to the minus 2 root a b um, times e to the f of a, but e to the f of a is just some other function of a, which we may as well just write as g of a, right? Just some, some term that depends on a only, it doesn't depend on b. So here's where we're going to use this standard Gaussian integral that I mentioned at the beginning. That's basically our boundary condition, right? Because we know when v is 0, right, i is the square root of pi over a, and what that means is um, sorry, I forgot my equal sign, didn't I? i equals the square root of pi over a. And so this function g of a is actually just root of pi over a, right? Because if we plug in 0, if we plug in b equals 0 into this exponent here, we get e to the 0, which is just 1. And so we find that g of a is just the square root of pi over a, right? So that boundary condition implies that g of a is the square root of pi over a. Um, and so we've actually arrived at our result, right? We just substitute back in g of a is root pi over a, and we find that i is equal to e to the minus 2 root of a b times the square root of pi over a. So there we go, we're done. Now, there is actually another completely different method to do this, um, which is using a substitution uh, it's not really an obvious substitution, but it does work. And so I may do another video on that in the future. Uh, let me know if you're interested in, in seeing that alternative method.